So we have the rock stars of the Gree world here with us. Whoop, whoop. So we have Dr. Ramsey, Dr. Trainellis, Dr. Banky, and Dr. Paduri joining us. I know. Nor have I. We have to share. All right. I can share. Yeah. Okay, so our first question that we have was from yesterday's session. Could deep brain stimulation help some of our children as it has helped one Brie child? Um, uh, we don't have enough data yet to say that that's something that we should be considering. Be good to know more about that child that had deep brain stimulation. So my question is, is are they in the registry and have they followed a follow-up, um, filled in their follow-up forms so that we can track that? I'll make a comment in terms of, you know, what deep brain stimulation could be used for. I mean, we learned about it as neurologists really first in the context of Parkinson's disease. So for adults with Parkinson's disease, um, and then it's been used for children with some genetic neurodevelopmental disorders, including GNA01 condition. There's a, an experience there. Uh, it's also now being considered for some forms of epilepsy, but I'll underline some uh, because it's it's really sort of new and and you know as Dr. Benke said, not exactly worked out. It's not really at prime time. So I, I think the short answer is we don't really know. And I think a, a bigger answer is is it going to be specifically useful for gray disorders, or is it just going to be potentially generically useful for movement disorders and possibly for seizures? That's that's kind of the big unknown. Okay, so we have a couple of questions related to the registry. This person says that they live in the US and they registered for the Leipzig database, not the Colorado database. Is that a problem? Should they also register with the Colorado database? Um, it, no, it's not, it's not a problem. We'll um, figure it out. <laughs> also, somebody wanted to know if they could. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Johannes, we can't see you because the light. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, it's absolutely no problem. Um, when uh, American patients contact us uh, to register in Leipzig registry, we always uh, say, please go to Colorado. And I know that Tim does the same, but if there's sometimes a mix up, it doesn't really matter too much, but we would like to have the Americans be recruited here and the Europeans recruited uh, in Germany. Can I ask a follow-up question, which is just to avoid double counting uh, because we do have some recurrent variants. Um, would it be helpful in those scenarios for the families to let the study coordinators know or maybe even share the study ID number or something like that to be able to keep track? So um, we're working out a way because there is the possibility of overlap between our database and the Simons database and the Leipzig database. It's always a possibility. And what if families know that they're in one, if they email us to let us know that, that's great. We can keep track of it that way. But um, We've, we've come up with a system to make sure that um, we're not double counting anybody. In the same vein, somebody wants to know, how do they check to find out if their child is already a part of the registry? Um, they can email us, grinresearch at cunshoots.edu and we'll try to figure it out. Perfect. Or Johannes's email. And, yeah, and also we will, we will see when there are um, several patients with the exact same variant, the same gender and the same age, um, that's too much of a coincidence for indiv uh, different individuals. Perfect. So our next question is, uh, this person says that their daughter has a GRIA2 loss of function. What does that mean for their receptors in terms of the functioning? Right, so, so GRIA2 is one of four subunits that form an AMPA receptor. There's GRIA1, 2, 3, and 4. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, GRIA2 has some special properties that it endows the receptor with. Uh, it, it's, it's not so simple that you could ascribe a, a series of brain functions and properties to the lack of, of uh, GRIA2, GLUA2, but at a cellular level, they will, it'll change the flavor of the receptor, it'll change the ions that permeate, it'll change its block by some intracellular, uh, intracellular molecules. And so it will almost certainly alter uh, synaptic connectivity and possibly synaptic plasticity. Uh, the outcome of that 
you know, is impossible to say at a, at a uh, behavioral level, but it, it will change function at, at virtually all the excitatory synapses, many of the excitatory synapses in the brain. So our next question is regarding variant classification, is benign or likely benign common? Yes, <laughs> I, but I'll just illustrate. Sometimes when we have a first consult in clinic and I'm sitting with a genetic counselor and a family um, and a student, we'll sort of we'll say, let's just look at the variant and let's, let's look up your variant um, and make sure it's not in a population database of people who are supposedly controls. And we do that, that's a Broad Institute database. It's actually just across the, the road here. Um, and then let's look at, at some of the databases so for the Grin disorders and the greed disorders, we actually have a nice portal, but there's also a ClinVar, which has a lot of cataloged variants and we'll sort of sift through and say, wait, you're, you're at position number yeah, 644. So let's look through and let's kind of get to there. And the students will be like, don't, don't you prepare ahead of time? So, yes, but I also like to emphasize to everybody how many variants there are, right? There are many, many variants in all of these genes and many of them are benign likely benign, some are of uncertain significance, some are likely pathogenic, and some are pathogenic. So it's not just an exercise, but it's really just to sort of give people a sense that there's lots of people out there with lots of variants in the same gene. It's just some are actually responsible for people's conditions and, and others are not. Hello. <laughs> Quick question going off of that. How do you change or how do you have your classification change from uncertain significance to a pathogenic? Steve? <laughs> do you wanna talk at, at a patient level? So I think what you're asking is, is at the patient level. So you've got your report back and it says one thing, yes. but the question is, is how does it get changed to something else? And so these sorts of things, and Dr. Paduri will, will talk more about it, but basically when you get your report back, what they're telling you and your clinicians at the time is at the current knowledge, that's what they think it is. And so we often ask um, families, you know, when you're being evaluated for any sort of genetic alterations, is you come back because that information changes. And um, I don't know if Dr. Lemke or, and if you want to add more to that. Yeah, this actually came up in terms of the Simons collection. Are we eligible to enroll in Simons if we have a VUS or a variant of uncertain significance? Um, and it's just that all that means is that today there's not enough evidence based on population databases, functional evidence, and so on to say that it's definitely disease associated. Uh, part of the calculation, and there is actually a, a sort of formal calculation for every gene and you could do for any variant, Part of it is, does it fit with what's known clinically? So if somebody came to us with kidney disease and no neurodevelopmental conditions and sort of went to geneticists and said, oh, I've got this GRIN2A variant and it's a VUS, we're sort of thinking, well, that doesn't really fit quite well. Then they, they don't get that point for fitting with what we know about the gene and what it's supposed to do. But if it's a good fit, we'll often consider a variant of uncertain significance with a good clinical fit of, plausible causative variant. We just don't have enough data. And that's why I looked over at Dr. Trinellis because sometimes the, the information that's available from the functional studies done in his, his lab and others can actually push us over the line to say, wow, it, well, this is actually a change that at least in the dish with some cells can change the function of that particular gene. So that, that yeah. is information we take, even if it's not um, yet incorporated into the formal classification. So I guess my question still is who is responsible for making that classic classification change? It's ultimately your clinicians. So your clinicians will put in, even though the report might say uncertain, but your clinicians will say, this is what we think it is. This is our impression and opinion. And it you know, may take a while for the report to get updated, but sorry, if I look straight at you, I'm going to get a migraine because of where that, that light is. Um, but it, it's up to what your clinicians say and put in the chart ultimately. Okay. So, so speak with the clinician. Yeah, yeah. After and the it may be that, you know, basically, you know, a paper has just come out, say from um, Dr. Lemke or, or, or Dr. Trane Ellis that says, oh, that this particular variant is pathogenic. And then, you know, you may be the one that hands that paper to your clinicians to help inform them about how making that change. 
The testing labs also can formally update the classification. You can sort of ask them, you meaning the clinicians uh, can ask them to do a, a reclassification or an attempted reclassification um, if asked. They, they won't do it you know, every month or so, but we often tell people, you know, check back with us in a year. And if it hasn't been reclassified, we can ask them if they would reclassify. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, that the it's really the American College of Medical Genetics that sets forth the kind of criteria by which all the labs classify their variants. And so there's different sets of, of evidence that they have to meet in order to place each one of those labels. There's additional layers in that some of the more specific genes have their own set of people that are very familiar with how they work, um, that are working with the, um, I think it's Clin, uh, ClinGen to kind of have um, say an, a group of NMDA experts or a group of potassium channel experts to say, okay, yes, you have those baseline criteria, but we know more about this particular gene and we're going to give you some additional criteria that help to update it. But that, that, that has yet to be kind of integrated into all of the genes. I would also add to Anne's point from earlier about benign and likely benign that you, she does that because of how important it is to understand the back backbone and the and the back picture of genetic variation, which is that if you were to compare her genome and my genome and the person down the street's genome, there would be 3 million variations amongst the spelling of our DNA. And that's how evolution happens, right? Our, our DNA is not copied 100% uh, um, fidelity with 100% fidelity every time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to react to new situations or change or, um, you know, have different adaptability over time. So the reason that we have those variations is part of human nature, and it just happens to be what type of variation it is and where it occurs that make it either nothing to worry about or something that causes symptoms in, in people. Johannes, did you want to add any more? Because you are in charge of that ACMG committee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so actually, uh, what always should be done is uh, testing the parents. If uh, the variant is de novo, that is pretty strong evidence that, uh, that it may also be the disease-causing variant. Um, if then uh, Steve Tranelis is able or his lab is able to do functional testing and find out also the functional properties of the, um, uh, of the NMDA receptor have changed, then this is, again, additional evidence. And if this all comes together, this should be enough evidence to say whether it is uh, likely pathogenic or not. And uh, it's also quite important to compare the variant not only with population databases and see this variant from a child is not seen in 300,000 individuals from the healthy population, but it may be seen in another patient with a um, green disorder or so, uh, which is not a completely open database. It's, uh, it's uh, being partly published on the green portal, but um, so if you have such variants that you're uncertain about, you can also contact us and we, we reclassify it and, and provide the information that maybe helps you to, at some point, have a clear answer. We're always happy to talk to your clinicians. We, we can't give you advice directly if, if you're not necessarily our patient, but we're happy to talk. Get, reach out to us. Perfect. So our next question is for Dr. Ramsey. For small three-letter word deletions, what are the options in terms of gene therapies? This was based on yesterday's talk. Right. Um, so prime editing comes to mind. That would be one where um, that could work. And the gene replacement could also work um, if, if it works. I mean, but that those would be the two that I would think of. Perfect. So our next question is, given the wide phenotypic variety in GRE disorders, do you have any advice for parents of young children who are looking for a clue as to what their child's future abilities or disabilities may be? For example, their son has a GRE 2 variant, uh, epileptic encephalopathy, and cerebellar verm vermian hypoplasia. Do you have any sense of what those three factors would impact symptoms in terms of quality of life? Um. So it's, I, when uh, families come to see us, you know, I, I think that uh, what is being requested is uh, a lot of um, guesswork until we know more. I mean, again, this is one of the reasons why having the registry helps us provide better data to families. In other words, saying things like, well, this is what we know, 
based on, you know, a few patients. It'd be nice if we're able to base this on, you know, from having followed several families, you know, it's just better data, the more people that are involved in the registry when we are able to give this sort of information. Now, you know, when you look at that constellation of, of symptoms, we have to generalize as clinicians across those symptoms that are seen in not just CREA2 patients, but in other patients, what that potentially could mean. You know, some of these things uh, you might predict would have long-term implications, but I, I think we don't, we don't know enough. You wanna add more to that, Dr. Yeah, Ford? I completely agree. I, I think there are two things. Uh, one is that there are just general predictions that can be made if somebody has early onset epilepsy or an epileptic encephalopathy that are likely to be influenced by a genetic diagnosis, but don't necessarily require a genetic diagnosis. So even putting aside the gene and just saying, look, if you see somebody who's at this age having this many seizures with these sorts of struggles now, we grew up in the pre-genetic era where we could sort of tell you this is what you're likely to anticipate. These are the sort of problems you might have. And hopefully a good clinician will tell you we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know for sure, but I like to paint, if, if people ask, a sort of best case scenario, worst case scenario in terms of what have I seen outcomes like that to be. Then when you've got a genetic variant, uh, this sort of harkens back to the couple of questions ago, but let's think about how certain are we that it's actually associated with the conditions that are present and that we're seeing, because then it tells us, well, then we should really compare it to everybody else in the database or we can look to that group. And I think the, the broad range that we've talked about in terms of delays and seizures and all of those things are part of it. It gets even more tricky when we start talking about MRI abnormalities, structural variations. I think if you ask most of us initially when we started coming together, would you have MRI abnormalities associated with the GRE disorders, I, I, we hadn't seen them before. So we'd say, oh, well, that doesn't, probably not. There are receptor abnormalities, but then lo and behold, there are subsets of patients with various MRI abnormalities we've, we've come to learn about. So again, be sure about the genetic diagnosis, know that there's predictions that can be made more generically, but also I'll, I'll echo Tim's comments, which is that we got to put the cases together to understand them better. So our next question is addressed uh, to all of you. So what is your number one constraint while conducting your research? Is it people or funding? Yes. <laughs> uh, same answer. Yes, um, the funding has to come before you hire people. There's a lot of bright people who want to do research and um, we're not able to offer them a place in the lab because we don't have the, the funding. It's really hard to turn away, uh, you know, someone who's bright and eager and wants to do this, but this is, this is the reality, yeah. Just I'll interpret the people slightly differently, which is, of course, it's about the people with the disorders also who are motivating the research. So that's the why um, and the funding is the how. So our next question is for Dr. Ramsey. Uh, this person said, you mentioned yesterday that parent groups can be a good bridge between research and pharma. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Um, so pharmaceutical companies um, are interested in rare disorders because um, there are different um, rules for, for drug development and approval for rare disorders that um, it, it, is, it is possible to get a drug company interested in a rare disorder. And that's something that I think um, maybe, you know, five or 10 years ago, that was not the case. So this is really good news if you have a rare disease, but they still um, need to invest their money in wisely because they will, if they invest their money poorly, they will very quickly go out of business. So they need to choose things that they really believe are going to work. And uh, they, uh, so academics can, can do their best, but we aren't trained on uh, looking for the things that a, a drug company knows to look for. Um, so I think that, you know, we're not gonna get a grant to do that, the funding mechanisms that there are um, to essentially take a good idea and, and tweak it, make it a little bit better, that is not an appealing grant. And believe it or not, that doesn't get funded very much. So there is this gap in funding 
between um, the academic work and then what is needed to make it a less risky proposition for a company. So homology medicine, for example, they told me that they have two drugs in clinical trials. And I asked them, listen, are you interested in, in taking this forward if this looks good? And she said, well, if the drugs that we have in clinical trials succeed, we might be in a position to do it, but if they don't, we won't have the money. So that, that's the reality. Um, so what, what the, any kind of funding can do, whether it's an angel investor or whatever, is help bring the science to the point where it, you know, it's a good risk and it's worth doing a clinical trial for and, and worth investing every, everything that's needed. I, I don't think it's the only way that a medicine get, get made, but um, you know, it's, it's hedging your bets to, you know, to do it that way. Does that, hope that answers it. Um, maybe, I don't know if either of you have. Well, just, just from my experience in, in, in Rett syndrome, for instance, um, the drug that was just approved um, for the treatment of Rett syndrome, it's, it's the only drug that's meant to target a neurodevelopmental disorder. A lot of that initial work for that drug came through funding through, um, through family and patient advisory groups, such as um, International Rett Syndrome Foundation and Rett Syndrome Research Trust. So we are where we are now because there was a lot of that investment um, to get there. Speaking about investments, maybe this person who's asking this question has $10 million, but they asked, can I ask each of the panelists what they think the best use of $10 million in funding would be for both GRI and gener uh, generally rare diseases? <laughs> um, it's a great question. And it forces it, you know, it forces us to think not about everything uh, we are doing right now, because we're all pushing forward on a lot of different fronts. But it, it you know, it sort of asks the question, which would push farthest ahead and be catalytic. And you know, ten million dollars, I think, would best be used uh, split between work on the clinical registries, getting everyone involved, uh, funding predictive work and informatics and making sure every single patient, whether you know it's outreach or outright adding personnel to the labs is collected and followed longitudinally. And then I think at a basic level, uh, we need to finish characterizing all of the variants. So we have a lookup table. We wanna put ourselves out of business. We don't wanna do this forever. We wanna know exactly what every variant does and in the future when new patients come along there's no work to do you simply look up and you know exactly what that patient does and then a fraction of it would have to go to advancing both pharmacological and genetic treatments that's such a good answer that i agree i would have said to split it up that it would it would be a mistake to put it all in one basket because we don't know what's what's going to work and and i agree that the two arms are going to be the uh, patient registry and really the natural history. And, you know, that's essential. Um, and that requires a lot of manpower. And I, I recognize that it's also a lot of work for the parents, but it's essential. And, and that's part of building that lookup table is, is understanding the disorder better. But then there's, there's no one researcher that's gonna get it right. And I think that uh, as far as medicines, you need to spread that money out and um, try a lot of different approaches and see which one works. I'll only add that if every group of disorders asked that question, and if every one of them said, let's just give 5% of it to a, a larger effort to increase diagnostics, I think you know, increasing the availability of diagnostics to the broad group of mostly children, but individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders and epilepsy to increase the diagnostic rate, we'll then have more people ready for the trials that this whole pipeline will build. Some back of the napkin calculations, you know, how much would it cost if we knew that it was gonna work, say in an animal model? So we already knew that, how much would it cost for us to make gene therapy? And it's between 10 and $20 million. And 
you know, I think there, there are different ways of, of doing that. Um, there's the pharma way that we're all, we all know about. There may be other ways. Um, other countries are thinking about the academic solution, which personally, I think in terms of what can our healthcare system really sustain for all of these different therapies, it would probably be better to have an academic solution versus a pharma solution. Treatments for all of these rare disorders could swamp our budget for 0.5% of the population in the next 10 years. Um, those are the calculations by people actually who know how to make those calculations. That's what they're saying. So um, I, I think that you know, $10 million could go a long way, but it's, it's only part of the way. And it's, it's a little frightening, I think, when you think about it. Maybe I would temper the fear a little because it's the fear that I share with you, but um, you know, the, the cost of delivery for one patient for Nusinersen for spinal muscular atrophy, the cost of delivery for one patient with a, an ASO treatment that we talked about for a single variant rare disorder is, you know, it would take 20% of that budget, it's like one or 2 million for development and then delivery, it's a lot. Um, but there's also this phenomenon called Moore's law, whereas you know eventually the prices, the price of various things comes down. And these are, we've seen that with genetic sequencing. We've seen that with a lot of things. So I think it doesn't mean we don't build it, but we have to build it with the knowledge that if we were trying to, to try to apply it today broadly, we couldn't. Um, and we as practicing clinicians are not in the business of having to make the choice of, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick this one and this one and leave everybody else behind. It's just not ethical. Um, so I think as much as that's the reality financially now, I think we have to look forward to a future where hopefully the price will be less and we'll have to sort of think about how do we select based on clinical and scientific criteria. Perfect. So our next question is to try to make a treatment center more viable. It would be interesting perhaps to associate other medical conditions with similar symptoms and treatments. What conditions would those be? And are there some similar medical conditions that you would relate to degree disorders, I imagine? Would you like for me to repeat it? Yeah. <laughs> to try to make a treatment center viable, it would be interesting perhaps to associate other medical conditions with similar symptoms and treatments. What conditions would those be? I was gonna say, um, we have some representatives from Combined Brain here. And Combined Brain is um, a way to bring together these rare diseases. And I think that they've kind of cataloged what are the symptoms for each of these diseases. So I would say that they might have an answer for us to tell us what are the other syndromes that are similar. Um, already getting the grin, gria, grit together, grid, that's, that's really good. And, you know, so beyond that, I would say, you know, there's a lot of um, genes that are involved in neuron communication and they, they have a lot of overlapping phenotypes. So it could, it could be very, very big. Um, that's what I would say. All right, we'll open it up to the floor for a little bit. We're still getting messages in through the panel, but if some of the live audience would like to ask questions. Hello. <laughs> okay. okay, I have kind of some broad questions. Um, so kind of speaking to what you guys were saying about you would invest, if you had the 10 million, you'd invest it into different types of research. So I know translational research has been brought up a lot. Um, and I think some people might not exactly know what that means. And I know there's also basic research and clinical research. Could one of you or multiple of you kind of briefly explain what those different type of researches are? And why are they all important? Is one, do, do they build on each other? Is there like a level where we start with the basic and then where are we at now? And then also <laughs> what, what would be examples of each one? So like what's some basic research that's been done, some translational research, and then some clinical research. I just think in general, I mean, I technically know the answers to these questions, but I wanna hear you guys say it. So, so I'll just start out on that. 
Um, basic research, in my mind, the definition is knowledge for the sake of knowledge, and that always builds a foundation and creates opportunity for advancement. In the Grin world, an example, and I'll, I'll give a talk tomorrow, an example of that is to take one variant and not just ask how can we fix it, but ask why does this amino acid change alter the way the receptor works? And I'll, I'll show some data on that. The front end of my talk will be purely basic. We'll say this amino acid moves. There's a tunnel that is created in the protein. Water goes through the tunnel and dissociates the agonist. That's why this variant reduces glutamate potency. That's a description of basic, although knowing that allows you to begin to think about a solution. Translational, in my mind, and everyone will have a little bit different view, will begin to ask questions about how can I uh, rectify this, even if I'm not working on a future drug for the clinic, how can I do an experiment that will actually generate data that will speak to you know, solving a problem of treatment? And an example would be to test a tool compound that might enhance or reduce a receptor's function and ask the question, does that work on the variant? And if it does, does it work on the circuit? And, and, and if it works on the circuit, can we, see a can we see a behavioral change in an animal that carries that deficit? So those are two, uh, just two examples, um, a basic and a translation you know, from the non-clinical world. Wait, but just, to, just so I can clarify, Translational work, I think, as we've seen, based on your definition, it sounds like it's already being done in many research labs around the world. Would that be a correct statement? Correct. And a lot of times, you don't know that you're doing translational work at the time. When it was found that uh, NMDA receptors are important for long-term potentiation because somebody worked with a compound that blocked NMDA receptors. I can't see, where's Graham? Is he here Some. I don't know if he's in here. I think but, he's in a different session. But he didn't know that there was gonna be, you know, 40 years later, this group. Um, but it became, when you look back at it, it's translational. But I think that the next question is, there's translational and then there's also what we call preclinical. So when you're setting up something, You've got the basic finding, you've got a translational find, which means translational means, oh, I know how to apply it. Then you put it into what looks like a, will lead to then really inform what a clinical trial will look like. That's preclinical research. In other words, what Amy is doing, which is, you know, we've got this group of mice, we're all gonna treat them. And, you know, Steve's done the same thing it's really setting up, well, basically you just switch the, you're not doing rodents anymore. It's gonna be a group of people, then that's preclinical research. Does that, do we think we're, we're getting there, Liz? Um, I think so. I just wanna make clear. So is there one area we need to focus on more or right now, would you say generally we're at the level where most people are doing translational research? I, I, I would probably argue um, all of the all of the experimental scientists interested in in the grin uh, the grin variants are doing some aspect of translational research. I think the moment you introduce a mutation into a gene and you begin to ask what's it doing a neuron and how can I fix that that by definition is translational. And so I would argue that most of the labs working on that are fully engaged in translational. And in fact, there's a lot of information out there that's just working its way to papers about hypothetical treatments, whether they're genetic or they're um, pharmacological, not with drugs or genes that are gonna be in patients tomorrow, but, but tools that will demonstrate, as Tim was saying, feasibility that, that you, these approaches work. Okay, so one last thing. So would your, so I know we don't have the 10 million, but would your opinion be at least that with what we do have, which I still think is pretty darn good, um, do you think we're doing a good enough job spreading things to where they need to be and covering as much of our bases as we can? I think you're doing an awesome job. I wasn't saying me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fishing for compliments. The, 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 the I'm general. just saying... Are there holes that could be filled that we could be focusing on? 
in terms of like funding research? I think it really does take the whole ecosystem, right? You, yeah. and, and I think this group, particularly the group here has shown that it, it can be done and it can be done synergistically. So it's not that there's a registry here and a registry in Europe in isolation, but there's right. two registries working together and the observations from that could lead to a perspective, you know, natural history type of study, which would be one way to get to clinical trial readiness um, in the same way that there are cellular and animal models that are going to get us to clinical trial readiness in a different way. And then the development of treatments and the application of treatments. I think maybe if I can extrapolate sort of, you know, what, what's the goal? And the goal is to get to treatments. And then all of these are different sort of parallel tracks that need to happen uh, individually. But I think the fact that they're happening here and the basic folks are talking to the clinical folks and, you, and are talking to all of you, I, mean, I, I like to think that that's gonna accelerate it faster because it's not like people developing animal models are wondering, well, what should I look for? We know exactly what to look for from the family's experiences and the clinical experiences and then vice versa. We, you know, what should we be measuring in our patients um, that would be helpful if a trial were to become available? Well, let's see what that, let's see what's happening in the animal models and the preclinical models and what types of things could we hope to change? So I, the fact that it's all happening in you know, parallel tracks that are talking to each other, I, that, that is, I think that's the best way to move forward. Okay, cool. Thank you. The other thing I would add is, is I, I think in order to move towards clinical trial readiness is you know, having centers of excellence where groups of patients are seen is going to be critical because when somebody has a therapy, that's where the companies are going to go because you've already got groups of patients there that are going to be readily recruitable for a clinical trial. Hi there. Uh, am I on? Um, I've been thinking a lot today about uh, how sufferers of GRI disorders can exhibit a wide range of severity of symptoms of different sorts. Um, even I've talked to some folks about even uh, people who even have the same protein variation as somebody else may exhibit widely different symptoms and severities. So I wanted to ask, first of all, do, have you found in your experience that that is true? Um, do we know why that is? And I also wanted to ask if that's something that you've also seen in the research with mice, um, that seeing wide variations in severity of symptoms from mice that have the same uh, variation as each other and whether that affects the control groups or the outcome of the research in any way. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the mouse part. Um, when we made the original knockdown mouse, um, with mice, you can have, you can control all the genes and you can have mice that are like identical twins. So it makes it nice because we can pick up on subtle things. We've, we've controlled for so many other things. We're only looking at the change in one gene. And so when we started moving this mutation onto different genetic backgrounds, we did see that in some it was lethal in some, it was lethal 100% of the time. DBA was the background, it was lethal 100% of the time. C57, it was lethal 80% of the time. Um, 129, it was not lethal. We had normal Mendelian genetics. So the strategy that we took when we were um, making the mice then is to have one parent be one genetic background, another parent be another genetic background, and bring them together that made the healthiest mouse. And we really needed that mix of genes in order to have a mouse that we could study. So um, I, I think that a geneticist would say that likely there are other genes that are modifying, that are subtly uh, changing um, you know, all of your organ systems. And this, you know, all of these tiny little uh, changes that make us unique can also, um, you know, shift you one way or the other. And um, I appreciate that, you know, parents don't like to think about their genes might contribute to whether a, a symptom is severe or not. But I would say that you've all done so much for your kids just by being here. I, I think, you know, you've got to let go of that and know that, of course, you can't control the genes that you gave your kid, right? Um, but the, the story is that the other genes are probably the explanation. 
or why there's differences. The other thing might be biological sex. Sex hormones can sometimes play a role and it could be that the symptom is more severe in males than females. Um, but I mean, we see this in mice, uh, but I don't know that it's been borne out with the patients. So I'll, I'll pass this to you and maybe you can. No, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's the things well that, are, yeah, very well said, the things you can control in the mouse so you can you know, know exactly what those genetic factors are. We now with genome could look very broadly, but we, you know, we've just gotten in the last 10 years to have enough samples collected and statistical power to say, well, this, this gene is definitely associated with this condition and so on. We now are talking about the millions of changes that Kristen Park mentioned earlier that we all have between each other. We don't really have enough patients and enough data to be able to make a lot of sense of them. But people are starting to, to try. And I think that the patient collections and the collections through groups like Simon and Combined Brain are a good way to, to look. Maybe there are modifiers, maybe there are little changes that half the population has and the other half the population doesn't have that will mean you have a more or less severe disorder, whatever that disorder is. We, we don't know those things, but it, it's, a, it's a good theory. It's a, it's a theory that uh, has yet to be disproven and kind of makes sense, but we don't have data yet. I, I would like, hey, Dennis. I just would like to comment on this a little bit. So, um, I'm, you know, we're working on many, many gene disorders and um, one thing is clear, so um, that the genetic variant, each of, um, that people, for example, have a truncating variant in green 2 a versus those who have a missense variance. The truncating variants, um, people will look more similar to another compared to the ones with the missense variant as a group. So on, so what I want to say is, um, it is clear that the genetic variant has some power towards looking more similar to another for people who have similar variants, so it's just as a group. But there's a range. And one thing, and that's why I stand, stood up, um, what, we, what is really important is what is often not done well enough is to capture um, also the environment in our registries. And so what I mean with this is the drugs which a person has been exposed to, the complication a child might have had, like, for example, um, feeding problems, coma, or other kinds of induced um, problems. And often we just look at the variant and the clinical spectrum of that person at a specific time in life, let's say by the age of 12, but we're ignoring all the other factors which can enhance or improve the situation. So often, you know, I'm a geneticist, I need to defend genetics, right? So um, genetics gets, um, you know, the comment that it's not that strong or there's a lot of variability or there's genetic background. And we have done a study where we could show that it's genetic background is plays a role. But in my personal opinion, it is an opinion, we don't capture enough of the environment. And in particular, who children who receive at a very young age drugs which act on the, you know, our brain um, function, we don't capture good enough how that can have an effect on the expression at a later age. And not talking about coma, feeding problems, and other really extreme phenotypes, which often children have when they have to be in the NICU for like two or three months, there is another child who maybe lived closer to the hospital and didn't need to go to that extreme stage of the disease where they had to be hospitalized for a while. Later on, by six years later, we compare them in a database with 20 data points and they look different, but we um, don't capture at all the history. So that's why I strongly argue when you participate in these registries, really give all the information you have and um, really encourage everyone to um, you know, not be fatigued to enter more data sometimes than less. And now it's a lot of information, but it becomes more and more clear that we need to capture even more information than we already capture today to understand sometimes these relationships from the genetic variant to the disease, because the disease is not just genetics. It's um, everything what um, you know, the person experienced at that time. Um, Thank you. This is, 
this is kind of similar to you know the collection of data and um and the registry so um, my husband and i just found out about our daughter two months ago and immediately our genetic counselor at boston children's requested that they um that we agree to send the information to someone named alan byatt in um, europe and um we don't really know why or what he's doing and we're not sure if you're familiar and if you can kind of give us some information about um that i have um been in email contact with him every once in a while and um i'm still not really sure <laughs> yeah i can i can give you a little bit of information uh alan is is a collecting a database of gria variants he's been doing it some time he's aligned with johannes's database working on the same sorts of approaches as the Grins. He works with a number of other individuals on the AMP receptor, and they are uh, following pretty closely what uh, this group has been able to catalyze with the Grin variants, to try to create registries, try to create functional understanding, think about translational ways to fix the problem. Uh, and and uh, so I would not hesitate to interact with Alan at all. He's, you know, I, I sort of see Alan as on the team. Yeah, he's well, also giving yeah. a talk tomorrow, so he's, you can he's listen in for that. Part of the group. I'll, I'll echo that. I actually had a chance to meet with him personally. At, uh, his, his former supervisor, Rekke Muller, in, in Denmark arranges a genetic epilepsy meeting every couple of years in, in Denmark, and you know, many of us participate in those collaboratively, so certainly part of the, part of the community. Um, I have a question for, uh, for Amy, actually, for her talk. Um, so you talked about AEVs and being limited in, in terms of storage capacity. I believe you do have a grin to b mouse. Um, what are the ideas for, for, for grin to b to make it fit? You also mentioned that there were ideas to use lipids and proteins. Um, right, I was wondering if you could comment on that. An opportunity that. to expand on that a little bit yeah. more. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, Right, so the, the GRIN2, A, B, C, and D are bigger than GRIN1, um, but they would still fit into the AAB um, threshold if you used a very small promoter. And so what we were thinking is, um, and, and these exist that like we're, we don't have to invent them. There is something called a mini promoter. And so um, it's like just the minimal part that you would need. We don't have as many choices about dialing up and down um, for this promoter, but maybe we don't want a lot for the Grin 2s. So um, we'll just have to do the experiment. Maybe by the time we get there, there will be other mini promoters. So, you know, things happen so fast that you kind of have to um, lay down the like runway as the plane is moving, you know, kind of thing, and just hope that it will be built by the time you're ready to take off. But, you know, so that's what I'm doing is I'm thinking, okay, well, let's just make the mouse and let's just try this. And we'll, we'll kind of be used to it giving the virus. And then if it turns out there's another thing, we can switch and, you know, toss that. If there's ever anything better, we can move on. We're not married to anyone thing, you know, but, but um, for the lipid nanoparticles, this, there's a researcher at U of T named Bowen Lee, who is working on that. And, and um, but he's not the only one, there's lots of people doing this. And the idea is that you, you know, every cell is a mixture of lipids with a little protein sticking on them. And actually, cells can communicate with each other by kind of rubbing off these little packets of lipids and proteins and they stick on to another protein. And, and so we're, we're really just learning that this is yet another thing floating around in our bodies. It's always been there. They're called exosomes if, you, if you've maybe heard that word. But, but anyway, nature has already figured this out that there are ways that you can put DNA into cells if you code it in the right way. And so now the question is getting it coded in the way, can you code it in such a way that it would primarily go into one cell type? Because right now we don't have that kind of control. And so there, 
playing around, you know, chemists playing around with little mixtures of these different kinds of lipids and, and just testing to see, is there one that works better than another? Um, so if that is the case, then we, we don't have that hard, you know, deadline five KB and that's it that you would have with AAB. Um, so that's why we're exploring it, but I have no idea whether it will work or not. Okay, so lipids are not used in any other rare disease? Or um, any, uh... I know that <clears throat> we're not the first to be talking about this. I don't know off the top of my head who else is doing it, but I know we're not the only ones, you know, thinking of it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the floor at this moment? You can come to the mic. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Um, I was wondering if you could help the families understand maybe a little bit of the organization of this grin community. Um, so we hear things like combined brain, how does that fit into the picture? There's cure grin, there's grin to be, there's the clinicians, there are the researchers. I wish there were an organizational chart so I could understand how everyone works together, but I love that we're working together. Um, I don't know if someone could just kind of help give the 35,000 foot view of who we are. <laughs> well, I'm comfortable answering that question. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Cure Grid was actually founded by parents in 2019. We were fortunate enough to receive the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative grant, uh, the Rare is One grant. And so that was kind of the off the ground. Um, and there were already organizations that are in place that we collaborate with, including grin 2 b Foundation, many of the European foundations, um, and among several others um, that exist out there. So uh, there's lots of Facebook groups that this kind of movement started with where parents were connecting with one another. Um, and Cure Grin, our mission is to bring everybody together to search for treatments and cures together. Um, a part of that is joining things like Combined Brain, which is an organization that uh, caters to all kinds of different neurodevelopmental disorders. So we are actually working with Combined Brain um, to launch an IRB for one particular study. You can see them here today, collecting biorepository samples. And we work to build synergistic partnerships with researchers, clinicians, um, biotech and pharma. So as a community, we're all working together. Um, that might not always be so clear in terms of how we do that, but there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes to make those connections and move forward. Oh, I would just say that the the website that was built as part of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, it's really nice, it, it, it moves it away from Facebook to something that's a little bit more protected. Um, and it's a, so it's the Green Connect website. Um, and with that, you sign up as either a, a patient advocate, you know, parent, family member, or a researcher or a, a physician who's treating patients. and you can um, have one-on-one -on -one conversations with each other. Um, so I think that is the platform where you can get in touch with um, other parents. Um, parents post a question and the parents are the most active. If we were to improve things as a community, we would, you know, the, the scientists and researchers and, and doctors would get on there more. But when they do, they, they do try and provide answers. Um, and if you tag one of the researchers, you're more likely to get an answer if you kind of send that message with, can you please answer this question? Um, but, but I would say that's a, a good way to, that we're, we're communicating with each other. 100%. Uh, I could add to that also. Um, <clears throat> I liked your comment about uh, having an organizational structure chart. Um, that's actually a really good idea. And I can talk to Keith about that because I, I do see how it's confusing. Cause I mean, just really quickly, like, to be honest, like, so when my daughter was diagnosed in 2014, I, I consider that to be the dark ages of grin because there was no organizations. There was, I mean, these people obviously existed and I believe were already <laughs> studying GRIN, but there was no way to know that. There was no, when you Googled it, I mean, there were some papers, but you don't know who these people are and how to find them and there's no email address. So there was nothing. And so 
Grinch of Foundation started because there was nothing and I, we thought there needed to be something. And we didn't really know about this bigger world of all the other grins. So once the world started expanding, we were like, oh wait, we're part of something bigger. Thankfully, before it got too overwhelming where I was like, oh no. <laughs> I just made this website for Grinch Wee Foundation and apparently that's not what it is. It's more stuff. But thankfully Cure Grin came and did what they did. And we formed this really great partnership, which I know people don't, you don't see, but we're Grinch Wee Foundation and Cure Grin. We talk all the time. We're emailing, we're having calls. We're very collaborative. Keith mentioned yesterday that we're lucky because that is actually very rare. You would be surprised. Um, it's very depressing. In the rare disease world, there are many different rare diseases where the organizations, different organizations get started for whatever reasons and they don't get along and they don't work together and they just compete. And I would quit before I ever let that happen. If I thought that was happening, I would just be like, bye, see, ya. I'm done. I'm not going to have any part in that. So we just made a hundred percent effort to just be collaborative and open and not compete and just fill in their funding more research than we are we're doing the center of excellence we're all trying to do our part um we're also part of combined brain so we all collaborate in that aspect too so but i see how it's confusing for other people and so i think we could certainly work on making an organizational chart for sure and heather we also have our board chair here, Heather, if uh, you want to add a little bit how the GRIAs came into this whole picture, if you want to go to the mic, as well as the groups. So um, the GRIAs came into play a few years ago. I was actually reaching out to Dr. Lemka to figure out how do we find <laughs> cures. And he directed us to Cure Grin and really explained how we're all connected. And, you know, just being part of one group is the way to be. Yeah, I'll say it's also just in terms of concentrating the expertise, getting the scientists who are thinking about the basic questions and the potential for therapies. I think you're seeing already that there, there's so much commonality, um, and you know, both from the community building perspective, but also just from efficiency. You don't want Dr. Ramsey giving ten talks to ten different groups. You want Dr. Ramsey giving one talk here and then going back to the lab, right? And then supervising her, her group there. It, there's an incredible economy of scale here that I, I'm sure we all appreciate. I certainly appreciate. Um, and I'll just echo your comment from earlier that this is the exception. I think we've seen all too many times where there are multiple groups focusing on different aspects of one gene um, all of whom would like to host a gathering and all of whom would like to get the experts and all of whom want that attention, um, but who are not making that effort to work together. It, it, there's, there's a lot of give and take behind the scenes to bring these groups together. But I think from our perspective as physicians, researchers, collaborators, th this is the way to do it. Um, you know, I was very happy to review grants for grin 2 and then separately for Pure Grin and so on, but I'm even happier seeing them all come together and then we can have one bigger vision and one more streamlined process. It's a better use of your time, I think. Um, and it's certainly a more efficient use of everybody's time. And it gets, gets more people here, right? You can have everybody come who's interested in all of these different disorders in one place in a way that it's just not feasible and practical to do individually. So that this, this should be an example. And I think this is, you know, we, we have various ways to highlight that here, but I think there are also various ways we can highlight that across the rare disease community. And I think this is gonna be held up as an example of how it should be done. So let's say we get to the point of um, clinical trials for gene therapy. What would that like hypothetically look like? So we've got all these different variants and then we've got all these different genes. So let's say we would do um, a version of it with uh, green one, and then we would do different variants or are each of those medications a totally different clinical trial? Is GRIA um, gene therapy different or is like, you know, my daughter's GRIA one, is that different from GRIA four? Is it like, are we going to have 20 different clinical trials? Like how hypothetically will that look like when we get to that point? Most likely it will be 
many different clinical trials because each gene therapy is going to be fairly specific. In other words, the GRIN1 will replace certain types of GRIN1 variants and you're, it'll, be, it'll be pretty specific. So it may be that there's 20 different clinical trials, um, which is a bit daunting, but I think that that's, that's kind of the way the system works in order to get approvals. So. Great. So if you only have like, let's say 10 kids who have GRIA4, how does that work? I mean, can you have a clinical trial like that? So I, my thought is, is that once we, I mean, we're really at this, honestly, proof of concept phase. Um, is there any neurodevelopmental disorder where gene replacement therapy has worked? And the answer is no. But I think that in five years, maybe we've done this in a couple of disorders and our, our paradigm may change such that we can think about these more broadly and have clinical trials with smaller numbers. And the whole machinery for putting this in place is different. Um, I think that that's part of the reason why I favor an academic solution because it removes this issue of, we will only have a clinical trial for you based on some financial considerations perhaps, but more of the need. We, we know that you're there. We know how to do this what's holding us back? Is it just this one thing? So I, I think that our thinking about this is likely to change a lot in five years after we've done it a couple of times for a couple of different diseases. Anyway, that, that's what I'm hoping. I'll speak to the epilepsy side of things, which is that there is active discussion between people who spend their careers working on clinical trial design that you know, traditionally has been in adults and traditionally has been based on seizure counts. And there's all sorts of ways things have been traditionally done. The really ex explosion of rare diseases that involve epilepsy has challenged some of those, this is the way it's done. And there's active discussion between Epilepsy Foundation, the FDA, rare disease groups, um, really around how can we change the paradigm? How can we do things when there aren't 500 patients? You know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to try a new blood pressure drug, you'd get 500 patients and you'd randomize 250 to, you know, status quo and 250 to the other drug. We don't have that. We won't have that. Um, but there are other ways to do things. So I think there's there's a, a fair amount of emphasis now on developing these different strategies um, so that small groups of patients can be studied. It's it's. It still has to be done robustly. It has to be done reproducibly, but there are ways to do it that respect the small numbers um, and that also respect the given clinical presentation. So there's some rare epilepsies, for example, where children are having dozens of seizures a day. You don't necessarily want a placebo arm for three months, right? Who's gonna sign up for that? And so there's, it's, you know, people, some people from the trial design perspective consider that a practical consideration. I think we consider that an ethical consideration, um, but that's actually now being discussed. So I, I agree with Tim, it's gonna, it's gonna have to change from the traditional trial approach. It is a mess. Is, is that realistic? Cause I know the FDA is, is they don't change very easily. So oh, people, <laughs> people like our colleagues, uh, Jack, Jackie French. <laughs> Uh, maybe we should get them here next time. But uh, you know, Jackie French is one of the, the more vocal um, proponents of this. And she's she's been one of the people gather, getting people. We actually, she'll gather groups and she'll, mm -hmm. she'll gather a number of different groups and she actually plants them near the FDA headquarters. So they can't really say no when they, they have to show up for discussions. I was impressed the one time I've been able to sit in one of these round tables that they, there, there's a dialogue. Um, and there's- Is there a group, uh, a rare disease group that has gone through this? I'm trying to uh, think of who they- trials yeah. like that foreshadows what we would do. <coughs> Uh, you know, because where do you get a control group for this? It's yeah. I mean, there, there are some. I mean, I, I will say there have been some very well done trials that have not been successful. Those are important examples too. The Angelman world has actually gone through this with, not for seizures but for movement disorder, um, and have shown pretty definitively that L dopamine doesn't work. Um, but they were able to engage with the FDA, had a five year natural history study, had lots of data, and then you know really robust 
trial design. Um, it's unfortunate it didn't work, but now we know that we're not using that anymore. Um, so the, the structure is there. I'd like us to be able to point, as Tim said, to a successful example and say, this is how it was done and then it actually worked. But there's also a lot of examples where, you know, there was really strong translational science. And then when the clinical trials happened for a number of reasons, perhaps even ones because the FDA said you had to do it this way, is the clinical trials didn't work. And the ones where I'm thinking of in that case is Fragile X. Um, but again, I think that we're going to be in a different place um, if we know that things like gene replacement therapy are safe and they work in other disorders, that it will change how we think about doing clinical trials. And they're going to have to. And I think this is another function of the patient advisory groups is, is that you have the ability to approach the FDA. Um, they have something called uh, patient-focused drug development, um, PFDDs, what's the other? No, oh, that's patient-focused drug development. These are things where you engage with the FDA and you tell them what you want. And it's the mechanism that they have where they are supposed to listen to you. Fortunately, tomorrow at our keynote for Pat, the path to drug approval, Dr. Michelle Campbell from the FDA is going to be joining us. So, Oh, good. I need to talk to her. <laughs> Finally, she's cornered. <laughs> Insert evil laugh here. Okay, we still have a lot of questions left in the chat. I, I will give one last opening to the floor. If anybody wants to be brave, come to the mic. Hi. Um, we've talked a lot about micro situations where we're looking at research for particular genes. Just a macro question. Other more well-known movement disorders, neurological disorders, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, do we let can we leverage any of that research, funding, wealth of knowledge, or is it just you know, is it, is it relevant at all or not? Knowledge, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think there's, that we learn from each other, you know, thinking about different ends of the age spectrum, but a lot of the biology is similar. Um, drug repurposing, absolutely. Memantine was well used in the Alzheimer world before it was considered for some of the pediatric indications. Um, Funding, and I will leave to my colleagues to think about. I mean, a good example is when you run, you have a panel of drugs that you were running through the pipeline that would basically repurpose, potentially repurpose some drugs for, you know, treatments. Did you want to say any more? <laughs> Um, I think repurposing is a is an important word, and, and you know one of the things that the variants will sometimes do is they will take a either experimental drug or an FDA drug that works on a target, let's say a uh, NMDA receptor, and the variant can supersensitize that receptor, or it can eliminate the ability of that drug to work. And in some cases, and at least in one patient. The variant inside the pore supersensitized um, that variant receptor to memantine, which relieved seizures. It's it's a rare event, but it's a it's a uh, it's a tractable problem, and you can easily take fifty or sixty channel blockers and run them across variants with all sorts of modern technology, and sort of pick up the needles in the haystack. and And it's a small number; it's not going to become a a treatment for a large number, but every patient is, is you know, uh, worth the effort on their own. And, and I, think, I think that's a viable strategy and that fits completely with uh, exploiting what we've learned in other neurodegenerative diseases for, for the grins. Okay. So we have a question about dextromethorphan and memantine. Um, are these already being used in GRIE patients or are there any other currently available medications that, we, that patients should ask their doctors about? So um, those drugs would specifically be for uh, gain of function alterations of, of GRINs. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday, um, that it's, my thought that um, 
before we know that they're truly effective, uh, we should think about uh, actually evaluating these in a clinical trial um, for safety issues, because there's still the possibility that in some situations, it could make things worse. Um, if your clinicians are wondering about what to suggest, they can reach out to, to us. We can provide them with some suggestions. Our thought is, is first you need to know whether or not you, what your functional status is and that use of these should be reserved for either a clinical trial or in extreme situations where you're in an ICU, you're having multiple daily seizures, nothing else is working. So in, this is what we would call compassionate use. So that's where we think that there is the place for things like memantine and dextromethorphan and, and some of the other things. Um, you know, there is, um, uh, we're hoping that uh, things will move forward with the clinical trial for ridipridil, which would be for gain of function alterations. Again, that would only be available through um, a clinical trial. Did you want to add anything? No, oh, I agree. I mean, I think the, the examples you may have heard about were compassionate use examples. And at least in the US, that's sort of how you can um, use various compounds. I, you know, I, I will say, and I, I don't mean to make our basic colleagues uncomfortable in any way, but I, I, you know, certainly in examples where we've looked at the cellular and animal data and we've had clear evidence of gain of function and traditional drugs aren't working. Um, when you have drugs that do have established safety profiles in children, it, it's it's hard to wait for the clinical trial. And I, you know, I think for at least one case I have in mind, if we'd waited, we'd still be waiting. So I, it, it's a balance. Um, scientifically, we need to have the trials. We won't have definitive answers without them. Um, but I think this is something to kind of you know discuss individually with your doctors, but also have a discussion about what are the alternatives, what are the risks, and it, all of this is about calculating potential risks, potential benefits, and what alternatives do you have? Perfect. Well, that puts us at five o'clock. I want to thank everybody for their time and attention. Thank you all who submitted questions. Unfortunately, we aren't able to get to them all. We want to respect our speaker's time. Um, if you see them, they're very friendly people. So maybe go and ask them <laughs> if you have more questions. Um, but we want to give them a round of applause and thank them so much.